Drake. Yeah, we're rolling. Go on, bro. What was what? What do you want to talk? Because if you're not talking to me, I'm going to start talking. What is your point? My point is this. What 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 is the question? Sorry. Yeah. Like what? What are you? What are you here arguing for? So I'm a Christian. Yeah. And I believe that that in Jesus Christ is the truth that the world needs. It's the truth that you need. It's the truth that I need. It's the truth that all these good people need. They need to follow the Christ, who is the Messiah, promised of God in the prophets. And by doing that, we improve ourselves, we improve our society, we improve our communities. We're on the truth because we have a moral obligation to be on the truth. So you're trying to, are you trying to abolish other religions in this country? I, I, yeah, I believe that other religions, including yours, if you're not a Christian already, should convert to the Christian faith. So, so I'm Christian atheist. So, are you? So, what, what do you propose to actually do to, to go about that? Do you propose to ban Muslims or? No, no, I'm not. I'm not proposing that we ban Islam. No, because if you ban anything, you make it popular. But I'm curious if you object to the fact that in Saudi Arabia Christianity is outlawed. Uh, do you, do you, are you aware of that? Uh, I don't know. What a surprise! But, but yeah. so, so like, You're going to have to speak up for these good people. Yeah, so like, what are you, um, so, so what are your plans to change how things are? Basically? Well, I, I think that we have to start with ourselves. Yeah. We have to, let me ask you this question. Do you think that we should oppose, uh, yeah, I got you, is there a bit of a German twang to your accent? Oh. Where, where's your accent from? French. French. So the French know a lot about what it means to live under Nazis. Yeah. Were the French right to resist Nazi ideology? Yeah. Why? Well, because, uh, uh, because, well, it depends kind of on the, uh, it kind of depends what, uh, what you mean by resisting. Well, uh, uh, the, the French resistance, were they right, morally right or morally wrong? Uh, well, they, they kind of had to do this to... We know what they did, bro. I'm asking you whether they were morally right or morally wrong. Yeah, okay. I, I think morals are subjective. So you don't think, so let's be clear, the atheist okay. isn't sure whether it was right to stand up to Nazis. Concept. So you, and, and this is why, this is why the Christian faith is better than atheism. Because here is a Frenchman who should hopefully know everything that the Nazis did to the French, and yet he can't condemn Nazism. So you do think it's right to stand up against Nazism. So there is a morality. No, I mean, I I don't, I don't have it, like a morality. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's wrong. I think so. I think it's neutral. So why, 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 why do you think it? Do, can you not hear the contradiction in what you're saying? You're saying in one breath that it's right to stand up to Nazis, but you're saying in the second breath that you, it's not morally right. So is it right or is it wrong? What I'm saying is that there are no morals. There's no such thing as right or wrong. So is it right or wrong to stand up to Nazis? Neither. Neither? Yeah. So you're unsure about whether we should stand up to Nazism? No, but I'm saying there's no morals. So you're, you're saying that you're, you are sure? I'm, I'm still, I'm, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm still waiting for an answer. Is it right to stand up against Nazis? No. no. That's the problem with atheism. Okay. Now as a Christian, let me show you why Christianity is better. Because here you are, someone who's trying to work, by the way, consistently. I applaud you for your consistency. You're much more consistent than a lot of other atheists in the park. But here is an atheist who couldn't say that it was wrong to stand up to Nazism. But as a Christian, I can say that it is wrong to stand up. It is right to stand against Nazism. Why? Because as a Christian, I have a belief in justice. Guys, guys, film or talk, right? Like in terms of in terms of in terms of Christianity, we have a sense of right and wrong. We have a sense of justice and Nazism contravenes that sense of right and wrong and that sense of justice. So it is morally right to oppose Nazism. Okay. So, now I've demonstrated why Christianity... Now tell me, in your heart, in your feelings, which yeah. do you think reson, which one resonates more with you? Your logical position or my Christian position, however illogical you think it might be? Well, I think, I think, like, as it is just, like, my kind of uh, morality is neutral. So, uh, so there's not, nothing really that's right or wrong. But, but like as a as a Christian, I think you're, there has to be some morality that makes you know uh, you know things work together, and uh, I think you know, we need to adopt some morality that minimizes the violence in this world. So, so as long as we adopt we adopt uh, we, we define we define a right to to defend against an oppression. 
Brilliant. That is to protect the United as well. So now we've established that we can stand against oppression. Yeah. So you've established a morality now. Yeah. On what basis? That's that's I define the morality. You define the morality as a purely elective choice. But what makes your morality better than say, for instance, the Nazis' morality that saw conflict as a good thing because it advanced the social Darwinism of the species? Yeah, because it leads to more death and more violence. But why is that wrong? It's not necessarily wrong. There, are there you go. So there are, there, like, there are different sets of morals. So and we need to choose the one that minimizes the violence. Why must we choose the one that minimizes the violence? We don't must, but it's better for us. As Sh a, shall, as shall I tell you why you're arguing that way? You're arguing that way because whether you're willing to acknowledge it or not, you have been influenced by a Judeo-Christian heritage. You're arguing that way because God has put in your heart the law that he promised to in the scripture. Your creator has put that law there. And that's why even though logically from your atheism, you can't get to the position you're arguing for, your instinct is to argue for it. And this is one of the evidences of the creator. An evidence that you should accept because your own nature is fighting against your logic. Christ, Christ himself said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God, that they shall inherit the, the earth. Yeah, but does he try to minimize violence in the world? He, he teaches, let, let's, let's just look at, at this. Yeah, but answer the question, does he try to minimize violence? Or? He teaches, look at his teachings, yes, they do, and that's why I'm going to show you his teachings. Listen, listen to what he says. He says, listen to these and ask me, uh, uh, and, and, and listen to them. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So like those are like those are like examples. For these are these are the characters. These are the characters that the kind of characterization of the kingdom community, the Christian community. Yeah, I see. Like that in itself does not prove that that uh, he tries he's trying to minimize violence in the world. Well, for example, for example, take um, homosexuals. What about it? Yes. Yeah, so like he condemns homosexuality. He does. Uh, and yeah, he. Do you show me where he teaches violence against homosexuals? Uh, I'm not sure. Does he? He doesn't. He doesn't. What he does, what he does affirm though, is that homosexuals are made in the image of God, which means that they have a dignity that is independent of their sexuality. You have a dignity because you're made in the image of God that is independent of your religion. I have a, a, a dignity that is made in the image of God that is independent of my politics. This is Christian teaching. This kind of equality that we all have independent of any other factor you were born with it is a gift from God. Now tell me, does atheism, a truly atheistic logic, does that accredit human beings with that kind of dignity? Uh, didn't, didn't get the so I have just explained how Christian teaching gives each person essential dignity, independent of every other factor. You're born with it. You're born with it, it's a gift from God. No one gave it to you, no one can take it away. You can take it, you can, you can not live up to it, you can live, you can live below that dignity. Yeah? But, 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 from atheism, from a truly atheistic per point of view, can you affirm my dignity? Dignity will talk to you for Dignity is the sense that there is something intrinsically beautiful and noble about you that should not be trespassed unless there is a good reason to do so. Yeah, well, I can't really it. Based on what? Based on what? Because in a way I'm trying to minimize violence in the world and if, and if you, if you give, give to each person an, an infinite value. So, so you're not basing it on anything then? What, what are you basing it on? So I, so I think dignity, so like if the goal is to eventually minimize violence on this planet, uh, then, then giving, giving you dignity and giving each person dignity. But you haven't answered my question. You've said that you affirm that I have dignity, yeah. but you haven't explained why I have dignity. Because I, I, would like, I would like this, I would like each person to have dignity. So you're saying treat other people like you want to be treated. Yeah. You're appealing to the G teachings of Jesus. 
That's what Jesus taught. He said, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you're appealing to the laws of God. And you're appealing to the laws of God because God wrote them on your heart. And this is an evidence of the Creator. So once again, your heart is calling you to your Creator. Do you agree that we have a moral obligation to stand on the truth? Do you believe there is such a thing as truth? Yeah. Right. If there is such a thing as truth, yeah? If there is such a thing as truth, you've, you've already abandoned atheism. Because truth corresponds to reality. And atheism denies, atheism denies the concept of truth. Because if atheism is true, we are nothing but the random uh, chance correlation of, of, of atoms that have come together by pure chaos. Let me tell you what atheism it is, it is, it is that you are not, not, you are not convinced of any religion. I know what atheism teaches. But, but it means, doesn't mean that, that I, I know for sure that God doesn't exist. It means that I, I think there's a possibility that the Christian God exists. And there is a possibility that, that doesn't, but I'm not, I don't have an argument that convinces me that. So, you, so you're an agnostic? Have you moved from being atheist to agnostic now? So, I don't know that's the definition, but, but yeah. That's agnostic means I'm not sure. Yeah. Atheist is I'm sure. Ah. Atheists are sure that God doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And agnostic is I'm not sure. As in, I only believe what is objectively true. Brilliant. So do I. So, since we both believe in objective truth. Let me give you an, a, an evidence. Let me give you an argument for the evidence of God. You're getting wound up, aren't you? He's like, he's wanting to burst in. Ah! He wants, the Platonist wants to jump in. So, so let me ask you this question. Would you agree that mathematics is a language by which would describe reality in physics? So mathematics, like the way it works is that we define some, we have some definitions and then on top of that we build theories. Mathematics is a language of description. Do you agree? Do you agree that languages emerge from intelligence? Right. Are you aware that in physics we are discovering mathematics as opposed to using mathematics to explain the physics? Let me give you an example. The, 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 the theories of Einstein. General relativity and special relativity. They posit physical objects, at the, the, the time that Einstein wrote those theories, they posited physical objects that we had no observation of. We then later observed them, which means that the maths was ahead of the observation, which means that the maths was, we were tapping into a code that was describing creation, that was describing creation long before we observed it. Yeah, that, that, that's because we established a Einstein established a model, and then which uh, which was in, um, in which was in consistency with reality, with observation. Brilliant. No, he tapped into a code that it was, we were discovering in reality. Let that, let those words settle in for you. Einstein tapped into a code that we discovered in reality, not that he used a code to describe reality. Now, if he tapped into a code that we discovered in reality, then that means that there is a code in reality. Can you tell me of a code without a code giver? Like, I don't see what you mean by code. A code is a mathematical code, you know, like zero and one, like binary code. Yeah. That's what I mean by code. Okay. A language. We have discovered a language in creation. We've discovered a language in creation that we're tapping into. And the maths is ahead of the science. The maths is ahead of the observation. I, I wouldn't say you discovered it. Prove it. Uh, I so, say so it, okay, you're saying we didn't discover it. So, explain to me then, if we didn't discover, if we aren't discovering the code in creation, explain to me how we had mathematical models that were ahead of the observations of reality. Yeah, sure. I'm not, that's true. We had mathematical models that were able to predict, uh, uh, predict what's going on in reality. So we accept there was a code. Because we make, we make logical uh, inferences based upon our observation and, and, and the theory that we made out of it. But that code, sir, that code, mathematics and numbers are independent of creation. Are you aware of that? Have you ever studied math, the philosophy of maths? Do you, do you know about negative numbers? 
Do you know about the imaginary numbers? There's models of maths that are independent of reality. There are models of mathematics that were independent of reality that then we observe something and then someone pointed out, oh, hold on, we've got a mathematical formula that explains that. Like Einstein's theory. So the point is, we aren't inventing the maths to describe reality. The maths is already in reality. We've just tapped into the code. So I'll ask you again. Is there such a thing as a code without a code giver? There is. Maybe, maybe. Prove it. Give me an example. I'm saying, maybe, maybe not. Well, I'm saying that we cannot think of any example of a code without a code giver. And the reason why we can't think of an example of a code without a code giver is because such a statement is illogical. So logically, where there is a code, there is a code giver, and that means there is a mind, which means that there is a God. Yeah, like there are gods, there are, there are objective realities, but, but, but why is there necessarily a mind, like a, a, a god? So give me an example of a language independent of mind. But also you have to prove that, that god is all, is all powerful, and that god is... Uh, so so, so let, let's, if, let's just, because you, you're not really addressing my first point, but let's address your, your point. If we accept as a truth that there is a code in creation that we're discovering, and that points to a code giver, as the one behind the creation, I think that it is fair, I think that it is fair to ascribe to that code giver the idea of almighty, all powerful. Because if that code giver is the one that gives the code and organizes the entirety of creation, I think it's fair to call him almighty. It's like you, let's say you create a create an, you know, artificial intelligence. Are you going to actually address the points that I'm making? No, I'm not addressing the points. You know, artificial intelligence. So here's the points that I'm making. One, there is a code that we are discovering in creation that is called physics. It's called mathematics. There's mathematical codes that we are finding in creation. We have mathematical models that are independent of observation. And then we have observations that match the mathematical models that we're building independent of observation. That means that we are not using the maths to explain the observation. The coding is there independent of our observation. And we are simply tapping into a code that is present in creation itself. And if that code is independent from, from our observation, then that means it is arising from a mind. No. Because, la Sorry, right, well, well, firstly, firstly, let's go back into what mathematics is. Do you know that mathematics is a language? Yeah. Right, can you think of a language that doesn't arise from intellect? No, but doesn't mean that. No, that no. Every observation of language if I, if is can, connected to intellect. Sorry, if I can think of it, doesn't mean that it's not possible. Yes, I'm language, only human, so, so I can't really conceive such a language. But I thought, I thought you based your assumptions on, on what was true. If every observation of language emerges from intellect, then it follows that until we find the opposite, we can assume, rightly, that, there is, that the, 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 the language you find in creation has arisen from intellect. Unless you can give me an example contrary. No, you, that's actually the, the burden of proof fallacy. You just assume something is true. No, I'm, I'm, using, I'm using the burden of proof established by Francis Bacon. The idea that individual observations amount up to a summary conclusion. Every observation of language that we have arises from intellect. Why would we change that rule just because we don't want to believe in a god? That, that's ultimately what happen, what's, what's happening with you, bro. You don't want to accept that there is a God behind creation, and so you simply say that we have observed a language, but it doesn't necessarily come from intellect. Like, how do you define God? Do you define it as, as some... Uh, as, uh, how, do you define how do I define God? Someone that stands outside of creation, that is all-powerful, that has mind, that is outside of space and time, and is non-material whose being is not contingent, that it's a necessary being, that those are my definitions. Okay, question. You said not material. 
how do you know there's not multiple guns? Let me finish with him and then you can come in. How do you know there's not multiple guns? Sorry? How do you know there's no multiple guns? I don't, from my argument. But let me ask you this question. I am willing to concede there may be multiple gods because of the observation. Are you willing to concede that there's any god at all for the same observations? Like the all powerful, I'm not uh, convinced. Why would I'm willing to concede. No, hold on. I think it's fair to describe this god or gods as all powerful because, in terms of our very definition of power, it is all the material and energy in the universe. And if they are behind all the material and energy of the universe, I think it's fair to describe them as all powerful. But I'll come back to my question that you jumped around. Here's my question. I am willing to concede there may be multiple gods. Are you willing to concede for the same observations that there may be a god at all? Yeah. Right, great. So now you're a step closer to truth. Yeah, I've always been taking this position. I, I, I think that there, there may be a god. Right, but I'm saying to you that we have a sufficient reason to conclude a divine originator. I think that there is later that uh, you know created logic, created you know, the planet, but but it doesn't really have the power to, to influence everything. But well, now you're just arguing about the definition of God, bro. And fine, we can have that argument. But firstly, do you accept that there is a God? Well, you to accept something, but the definition is not clear. So. Well, whatever definition you want to use, do you accept that there is a God? Yes. Congratulations. You just took a step closer to truth. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not asking you there may be. I'm asking you do you accept that there is a God? For some unknown definition. What? For some unknown definition. Okay, so the brother has started the conversation as an atheist, yes. but now he accepts that there is a God. Oh, okay, that's good. So congratulations. Yay. Well done. Right, now I want to give you the reason to believe in my God. Okay? Yes, I think I can. If we define all powerful as being greater than the sum energy of all known energies. Greater than... No, all powerful means that, that he has the complete control of everything that's going on on Earth. And, and yes, yes, I, I believe that. I believe that. Okay. So, if you agree with me, that the definition of all powerful means power greater than all other energies. Do you, do you understand? That's correct. He knows that already. He knows that already. We've already had an example of Islamic bad behavior. Here we're going to have it again. There you go. Sorry. We're having a conversation. He doesn't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk. You're just going to have to tell him to go away. Yeah, he wants you to go away. Okay. So here's, here's what I would like you to do. Because there's other talks that I want to have, right? I want you to, to go away and research this over this next week, okay? Research the prophecies that talk about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, okay? Because what you will discover when you research those prophecies is that, is that over the course of a thousand years, independently, are you listening? Different people spoke about a coming figure. And this coming figure describes Jesus Christ. It describes where he was born. It describes uh, the circumstances of his birth. It describes the circumstances of his life. It describes the circumstances of his death. And it describes the circumstances of him rising again. Now, one second, I want you to go away and to do this research. Because you owe it to yourself to know what you have disinherited yourself from. France was the once called the daughter of the church. It has played a huge and fundamental part of the history of the church. It was the, the defender of the church. It was a contributor to Christian civilization. That is your heritage as a Frenchman. And when you disavowed Christianity, you didn't just drop a set of doctrines and beliefs. You dropped an entire heritage and culture and a way of life. I think that, that's, uh, there's actually a problem 
the world is that people people define their religion based on, on their heritage, and I think that shouldn't be the case. I think each person should, should decide on upon independently of which. I agree. I agree. Some you know, of terrorists become terrorists because because their heritage is terrorist. I, 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 I and, and and indeed we see Muslims become terrorists because Muhammad was a terrorist. So in terms of in ter and, and France is experiencing that right now. How is that working out for you? So in terms of in terms of um, in terms of religion, you need to look, and I seriously want you to do this, please, look at the prophecies talking about Christ and ask yourself, how over this great span of history did these people come together to describe one singular life? Because that is an evidence that this God that created the universe is involved in the universe he created. The God that you now accept exists has shown that he is interested in what happens in the world through the person of Jesus Christ. And the evidence for that is the prophecies over a thousand years that describe one life. Bearing in mind, bro, a person can't control where he's born, how he's born or how he dies. Yeah. Assuming, assuming you, you take as granted that the, the books are true. You, so come back to me if you're, so if you're going to make the argument, sir, that these books are not true. You have to show me how the books of the Old Testament are not describing Jesus' life. Or, or you have to show me how the New Testament is false. So bring your evidence. Show to me that the gospel, the gospel stories are a lie. If you haven't got that evidence, then deal with the evidence that's in front of you, which is that Jesus Christ is the prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament. And that's where we started our conversation. When you asked me, what do I stand for? I stand for people like you coming to the knowledge of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, building your life on him, because when you do so, you won't follow the religion that is killing Frenchmen. You will follow the religion that defended France from those very armies. God bless you. So, any other questions before I go on to my next talk? So the kind of conversations I wanted to have today, I didn't manage to have. Have you become a Christian yet, bro? Have you become a Christian yet, bro? Yeah, brilliant. Let him do it. Well, unfortunately, okay, so let me come here. Let me ask you a question. Are you happy to have him off camera while he talks? Yeah, so you believe that Allah is one? One what?